the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2 and verse 22. We're going to make uh, what will amount to some fairly summary types of comments today from uh, this text. Uh, quite honestly, it, it gets a bit passed over. I, I don't think I even noticed the text until I was probably 30 years old. And again, growing up in the church and uh, going through so many Christmas seasons and so many sermons and Bible studies, but just I do not remember this uh, until I heard it preached uh, one Christmas season. And so one of the things that we have tried to do this morning is once again remind you that the Bible from Genesis, from the opening chapters, when the seed of the woman, who is going to be the crusher of the head of the serpent, is first prophesied. And from Genesis all the way to Revelation, when this very one, this serpent crusher, returns on that white horse to ultimately and finally defeat his enemies with the sharp sword of his mouth. And so this very Savior, this King, this Messiah, this baby Jesus is brought by his parents to the temple in Jerusalem. And we see what we believe to be an aged saint of the Lord. Sometimes I will use the term an old covenant saint. One in, in whom the Spirit of God had, had worked and illuminated his mind and gave him some insight as to what the Word of God had long promised and predicted and prophesied that, that this man, through the work of the Holy Spirit, was persistently and patiently awaiting the time that that promised one would appear and in fact God had confirmed to him that that he would live that he would not die until he saw this promised one one of the things almost as an aside here in Luke's text that you find is that all of the different orchestrations of the affairs of men serve as a background to the affairs of Almighty God again we do not use the term often enough but the word providence, the providence of God in that whether it's in the front or underneath, God is in charge of all things. All things happen because of their relationship to God by, by way of decree, by way of permission, by way of allowance, however he chooses to bring these things about. He moved on the heart of a pagan king to issue a decree that would place the earthly parents of our Savior in Bethlehem at the appointed time. And so, again, at the appointed time when the family, because of the, the law, the authority of the law over them, would come to the temple at the appropriate time to offer the appropriate sacrifices to, to the Lord. And so they come to offer the, the, the two dirtle, uh, turtle doves for uh, Mary's purification, again, in fulfilling the law related to childbirth, and then to offer the five shekels uh, for the redemption of the firstborn. And so they offer this prescribed sacrifice. And so out of all the many families that would pass through the temple at the appointed times, God, in a way that is not explained to us in Scripture, gave insight to this man that indeed this family going through the normal process that every Jewish family who had a son would go through coming to offer these sacrifices, God tells this man that this man, this family, that this is the one that he is to have, that he has been expecting, that he has been patiently waiting for. And so this very righteous and devout man, he had lived a holy life. He had been faithful to God, but lest we forget, he was a sinner who had been justified before God by faith, just like all men in all places and all times who have ever known God's forgiveness have been justified not by their works, not by their goodness, not by their religious observations, but by the grace of God through faith in the Son of God. And this man 
like so many of us, awaiting maybe the, the promises of God, the peace, the comfort that, that we would so desire and miss this life, we must be persistent, we must be patient, because many times we have to go through the dark valleys of difficulty. But again, this man awaited the appropriate time. And so he has these words that, that are, are prophetic, and, he, and they're words of praise related to this son that, that he now held in his arms. There in verse 29, my life is fulfilled. Occasionally, during the times of uh, championship season, football, basket, basketball, baseball, they will dig up some older person. Uh, I think in the recent times, one of the Catholic universities, I forget which one, had uh, a, like a 90-something-year-old nun that uh, they made a big deal about, you know, waiting for them to win a national basketball uh, title. Uh, certainly uh, Cubs fans, and it looks like us Auburn fans, are going to kind of be in that same uh, situation. We're going to be very aged uh, waiting for another uh, championship to come our way and then sometimes that we you know my life is fulfilled my life is complete well how much more so how much more so for this man Simeon he had served God he had he had waited he knew God would be faithful to his promise to bring the one who would deliver Israel and so now he can depart he can die in peace why because he has seen the Lord he has seen salvation incarnate. He has seen truth incarnate. He's seen the eternal word incarnate. And this one who brings salvation has done it for all the peoples of the world. Now, we could be good universalists and have the kind of maybe, maybe well-meaning, good-spirited thought that all people are saved. Folks, they're not. But God ordains that the gospel go to all people so that he may so work, so that they may be saved. We desire this gospel. There's no restriction on the, on the preaching, on the proclamation of the gospel. And so he is to have a, a worldwide significance going far beyond this tiny, tiny region of Palestine, such a small area in terms of the globe. And so this, this baby shall reveal God and God's salvation and God's judgment to the entire world, to the Gentile world. And ultimately in fulfilling this great promise to Abraham that through you all nations of the world, all nations of the earth will be blessed. Well, how are they going to be blessed? Through the son, through the lion of the tribe of Judah. Again, the righteous branch from David's family tree. And then Simeon speaks to those parents. and The baby at this point is 40 days old. Uh, we have a, a grandchild that's about 60 days old. And uh, our heads are still reeling. A and so uh, I'm sure this young couple's. Uh, they, they've had a lot going on over the last 10 plus months. And so this man that they do not know, this aged man, comes up and begins to speak to him and speaks of their son. And he says this uh, to, to them. He pa passes a, a blessing to them, but like a lot of things, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. Verse 34, Behold, the child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is to be opposed. Jesus himself said this, and I, I, I weary of saccharine, sweet, watered down, thin veneer Christianity. Okay? Jesus himself said, I didn't come to bring peace, I came to bring a sword. I came to divide people up. And the line of division is over the truth of the incarnate Son of God and His gospel. And it will divide many. Sometimes it divides families. 
Sometimes it divides communities. Sometimes it even divides churches over the great truth of the gospel. But again, whether we fall under God's eternal judgment or whether we rise to enjoy the great glories of heaven is all determined in our response to this one child, to this one man, to this one Savior who hung on a cross for us, whose name is Jesus Christ. And so indeed, he is a sign that will be opposed. And we can think all through the Gospels we find great animosity, great hatred directed toward Jesus, ultimately a hatred that would put him on the cross. But again, according to what? God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And so, Simeon observes and passes on in verse 35 to the couple, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also. That I'm quite sure, even before his public appearance, when he was about 30, and he began to speak, and, and some hated him. In fact, probably it would be right to say most hated him because of his words. And, but even growing up, probably his righteousness in comparison to the unrighteousness of even the children he played with. Now, I know a lot of grandparents are here, but let me tell you something. Your grandchildren are depraved and they're unrighteous, okay? Mine are. I can tell you that for sure, okay? And so, again, to imagine when some other child took the toy that he was playing with, he didn't selfishly and sinfully respond to that child because what? He never sinned. Wow. Go, go, come by the house one day this week and take one of Jude's toys away from him. See how that goes over. And so, he is an opposed sign. His life shall bring pain. To his parents because they shall see him suffer the assaults of a fallen world. They shall see him afflicted and persecuted because of the great realities that righteousness, the light of the world is never appreciated by the darkness. And so while Simeon finished his, his words for this young couple, we're introduced to another individual, a lady, again an elderly lady by the name of Anna, who was an old covenant saint. She worshiped God in the temple and again in hearing his words and recognizing the baby she rejoiced why why because her savior had appeared what she had lived her life in anticipation of fulfill fulfillment was now before her very eyes and so she began to speak of him the one that she had seen and to give thanks and gave the word that our redemption draweth nigh, that the Redeemer is here. And so again, this message of Christmas, of a child in a manger, is the message of God's gospel. It is the message of God's salvation. It is a message of God's good news for all people to hear that there is a Savior who is willing and he is able to save. Notice what I said there. You know, so many times when I enter into your lives and times of suffering, I'll make the remark, I wish I, I, wish I could fix it for you. And you know what the follow-up is, and I can't. I can't heal, I can't raise the dead, I can't do a lot of things to fix the situations. I, I can't deliver you because I'm not a Savior. But I know one who is. And I know him who is able to do all things and does them well. He is our King. He is our Savior. And so as we come this morning to celebrate communion, the Lord's Supper, uh, the, the testimony to our fellowship, our unity together as the body of Christ that meets locally here at North Clay Baptist Church, without the reality of an incarnate Savior, the God-man, the, 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 
the baby conceived in the womb of the virgin by the work of the Holy Spirit coming upon her, then this is just crackers and grape juice. And it won't carry you very far. You know, I, I doubt there's enough calories in that to allow you to get out that back door this morning. But let me tell you something. What these things represent has the spiritual sustenance to sustain you from this day all the way well into eternity because it represents our incarnate Savior who hung on a cross for our salvation.